Hello and welcome to Buildings of Tomorrow. My name is John Lester and in today's episode we are talking about the grid edge. I'm joined today by Sabina Ellinghagen. She is the CEO of Digital Grid at Siemens Smart Infrastructure. Sabina, thank you for joining us. Thank you, John, for having me. It's an absolute pleasure. So we're talking about Grid Edge. Um, we're talking about the impact that Grid Edge can have on our energy transition. Uh, let's start at the very beginning. What is the Grid Edge? <laughs> Good question. Um, the Grid Edge in our terminology is in traditional terms, where the energy is consumed. So the meter or behind the meter. Mm -hmm. um, so really the edges of the grid, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, why that is these days so interesting is because obviously consumers are not only consumers these days, but everyone has a PV, a storage. In future, many e-cars are around. So that grid edge becomes much more complex, much more lively. And it's not about only consuming, it's also by producing, by storing at unusual places for the grid, at least. Yeah, and, and I guess that's the huge shift that we've seen, isn't it? That that centralized model, let's call it, that was always how grids were designed has slowly but surely been shifted, has slowly but surely evolved. And now we find ourselves at a state where where it's almost the not the exception to the rule, but the rule that there is, you mentioned PV, so so solar generation or these other aspects that come into this grid edge space. And what, why is it so important? Why have we found ourselves in this position where these additional components, these consumers and prosumers and, and different roles of people have, have become so prevalent? What's driving this? I mean, what's driving it, it it's pretty easy. It's the energy transition, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think... It, while we think it already is the new normal, in essence, it's just the beginning. So when we look at the projections, we see a sevenfold increase of uh, decentral uh, energy resources coming onto the grid. So really what we think like, wow, there's so much solar, at least here in Bavaria on the roofs already, um, then it really is just the beginning. And that that, that seven times growth is really a revolution that is still upcoming mm -hmm. and very exciting, uh, exciting thing. And it's a revolution that's not only upcoming, it must come because the energy transition, if we want to achieve it, if we want to uh, achieve a, like a, a serious measure against climate change, then um, you must get to those levels of seven times what we have today. Um, and um, it really is also the fastest way for the energy transition to happen. Yeah, and I, and I like one of the points you said there is that it, it's not that it's a nice thing to have. This is something that we must have. And and it's not that seven times. Is, is seven times growth even fast enough or do we need to be faster? Absolutely agreed. And I think the, the interesting thing is it's like swarm intelligence, right? It is many different small places where things can happen and where things can accelerate extremely fast. If you look at how fast the switch from conventional mobile phones to um, smartphones happened, I mean, this was within a year or two, almost the entire population had changed. So that was also very many independent decisions of independent um, entities mm -hmm. that, that made that extreme pace happening. And that's really what excites me about the Great Edge so much is that for, this, for the good of the energy transition, we can make that happen um, and really accelerate that path, um, maybe to even unthinkable um, speed. Mm. And, and I like the analogy as well, because there's something to say for this evolution or revolution also being technology driven, because that all of these, these new independent uh, you know, generation and storage spaces they need to be controlled. They need to work in harmony. They need to to be connected and integrated effectively. And this has to be driven by available technology. Absolutely. And I mean, if we weren't at the stage uh, with the internet, with AI technologies and so forth that we are now, um, I would be scared of that pace and uh, about blackouts and that being something uncontrollable mm -hmm. or a waste of, of resource because then you build a DER and um, so a decentral energy resource mm -hmm. and you can't really use it because it, can, because it can't be connected to the grid. Um, so technology plays a huge role in there um, to control that, to manage that, to commercialize it. Um, you're spot on. 
Yeah, and and that's another interesting part which I'd like to touch on because you know you, you talked about the connection, uh, you talked about the commercialization of it. How important is that commercial conversation uh, when we're talking about these distributed energy resources or DERS, like you, you mentioned? It, how big a piece of that of the conversation is that commercial viability? Uh, a very very big one. I mean, ideally, if you want independent. Um, entities like a university, like a hospital, like any other industrial campus or um, also larger um, larger residential spaces, if you want them to take that decision, it must be two things. It must be A, easy, and B, worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Because if it's not easy, I mean, all of these uh, DER uh, investors or builders they're not experts in uh, in energy, right? They're not experts in PV and solar, in storage, in uh, trading, in whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so it must be extremely easy um, for not to have like search costs and it, it really be a lengthy, complicated process. Mm -hmm. And the second thing, it must be worthwhile. I mean, everybody will calculate the return on invest of s such a, an investment mm -hmm. and so the availability of markets is really where the rubber hits the roads. Mm -hmm. So if I can guarantee that I can achieve a good return on invest by trading my flexibility, by trading my kilowatt hours um, onto um, different markets, I can hedge my risks on that, um, then it becomes a no-brainer to do it. If I'm dependent on subsidies, if I'm not sure where, what the markets will be, if it's too few markets that might dry out, um, then my risk is too high. And uh, you see that in Germany at the moment, there was um, there was subsidies in. People did solar for the sake of subsidies. And then now the subsidies are running out and there was nothing to replace it with. So we mm. were in a situation um, where people were thinking about deinstalling their solar panels because it was just no longer viable to have them. Yeah. And, and that's the worst case, really. Yeah, I can imagine this is the worst case scenario because if we want to be fast, like you described before, and we want to we want to ensure that this revolution happens, so we can try and reach some of the goals that we have, because we know the global warming is here. We know that not only do we have to slow down, but we have to stop and go backwards. If anything, we can't afford to take two steps forward and one step back, or we won't get there. Uh, you mentioned two things there, making it easy and making it viable. And then you also touched on something around subsidies. Let's get into that in a second. But maybe we can go into a little bit more depth around around the ease and and viability, just so that so that we can understand a little bit more and the listeners can get a bit of insight. Because, like you mentioned, the if we're talking about a university who want to to have one of these distributed energy resources. They're not a, an energy retailer. They're not a, a utility. How can we, what do we need to do to make it easy enough so that uh, individual uh, individuals or, or institutions can invest in these kinds of resources? I mean, ideally you're looking for a one-stop shop, right? So yeah. you, you call uh, a number and, um, or go to a website and uh, you, you basically have it all thought through for yourself. So from where do I, like, what is it worthwhile? What's the calculation? How large is the invest? How do I get the financing right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a huge thing um, where also we uh, now offer new solutions ourselves because we saw that as, as a really big uh, hurdle um, mm -hmm. to get not an initial invest and then a long payback, but, but get that right. Mm -hmm. um, how do I get then the installer? How do I get it installed? How do I... Um, connected to a market um, and if you look like cases in in Finland um, there you have a, a, sh a large shopping mall called Cello um, and with them we we really put it all into one um, one stop so it's about connecting from the building the technology to the market um, and really optimizing whether it's self-consumption whether it's trading whether it's storage um, so the one-stop shop, uh, be it online or be it just the, the trusted partner that you can call, um, really is is the ease um, that, that it 
uh, requires. That we're looking for. And, and you know, you just speaking through all of those different decisions, it, it highlights that this is not simple. You know, it's not as simple as putting uh, solar panels, put, putting PV on your roof and plugging it in and walking away. There is so much more that comes through the process that's required. You, you touched on a couple of, of, uh, of examples there and, and actually had a, a a specific example with solo shopping center that around trading and self-consumption and these kinds of things, these sound like business models. And I guess this sits into that second point, which you mentioned, which is viability and the different business models that are possible to make these investments viable. Exactly. And um, the thing is you need to have predictive capabilities in order to understand whether it's viable or not. You need to be able to predict how much kilowatt hours do I self-consume how much would I store? How much would I feed back into the grid? What would be the price points for the feeding back into the grid? How can I, on top, um, trade flexibility? Flexibility mm -hmm. helping grid congestion, helping um, grid stability and, and so forth. Um, so all these different uh, revenue models, if you want, um, are layered on, or cost-saving ones, are layered on one on top of the other. Mm -hmm. um, some Sometimes you can't do both at a time, um, so you need to decide which one is, is worthwhile. Yeah. So you need to have sophisticated tools, a lot of um, algorithms uh, to be able to predict that mm -hmm. um, in the first place, to make that investment decision. And the second thing is then you need to operationalize it. So when it happens on the spot, the system in an autonomous way needs to take the right decision for you every second of the day. Yeah. And, and that's a huge undertaking, isn't it? And, and this is where that technology comes in to be able to swap from self-consumption to trading uh, back to storage and vice versa every second of the day it, it has to be facilitated. Like you said, you have to operationalize this with automated technology, and that's a huge undertaking. I think the interesting thing and where we optimize with um, our technology is to optimize for the technical feasibility, so the physics of it, right? You need mm -hmm. to get those right because we're still talking electricity. Yeah. Um, and on the other side, the monetary aspect. So you don't want to break anything or create a break a uh, blackout or something. Mm -hmm. So that's the physics side of things. You get got to get that right. Um, you don't want to degrade your battery unnecessarily. Da da da. Um, and on the other side, you want to optimize for uh, for the financial return, and you want to keep the the CO two uh, balance in uh, in place. So it's three different uh, things that you want to optimize for, um, and and that's really where where we invest a lot of um, thought into getting that right for our clients as well. Yeah, and it's it's almost the, the magician spinning plates, isn't it? To try and keep <laughs> the the perfect balance between these three is is a uh, is certainly no mean feat. You, you mentioned flexibility, and and maybe we jump back a little bit to to you know what's driving this revolution, and and how does how do these new energy resources uh, interact and cooperate with more of the traditional centralized resources? Is flexibility that driving force, is that one of the key value propositions that this distributed approach brings to, to the energy market? Absolutely. It's, it's a, a key part of that value proposition because, I mean, in, in the past, um, the grid was considered a copper plate. Mm -hmm. Copper plate means it's regardless of where you feed in um, a given uh, amount of uh, energy or and it's regardless of where you take it out. Mm -hmm. uh, with those grid edge der uh, installations, um, it's no longer the case. So flexibility on not only keeping the copper plate a copper plate, but really making that um, location dependent on on which feeder of the grid is what happening. Am I overloading a transformer? Um, how can I balance the the intermittency of um, the renewable energy resources? Um, is a much, much uh, more difficult undertaking. And uh, the role of the DS, also the, the distribution system operator, will um, change greatly. And um, their task is, is really unthinkable complex in the future. And again, here we are back to the to technology topic, right? So yeah, without exactly. technology, just a human brain. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't imagine a guy with a hard hat sitting with a lot of switches, <laughs> you know, chopping and changing depending. And, yeah. and, and maybe that brings us back to that initial point, which is why, you know, why is the grid edge and the, the thought process and the technology behind it so important or essential for this revolution? It just can't happen without the grid edge. Now, we've gone into the two points that you mentioned. You know, if we're going to make this revolution happen and if we're going to make it as, to be fast, we need independent organisations to, to take the leap, you know, to invest and go through the process. And for them to do that, it needs to be easy. And we talked about uh, the different processes that we have to enable for them. It needs to make sense fiscally as well. Um, you mentioned through those conversations, and, and you used an example actually of Germany where there were subsidies, now the subsidies run out, and, and this challenges the business model or the viability of the investment that has been made in the past. Uh, we talked about trading and markets. It, some of this has to be at least enabled by the governments. What is the, what is the government role in this, this whole process? Um, excellent point. I think you summarized it extremely well, and uh, that is really the, the point that we haven't touched upon yet, because the, the regulatory framework and the ability of, for instance, a DSO, what roles can they take, um, is, is governed or regulated by, by governments, uh, both on the national level as well as uh, the supranational level, like the EU's, um, is, is something that, that is super important. Um, and at the, and that, that's maybe where this, the pace is the slowest. Yeah. So you see that with the internet as well, <laughs> think upload filters or whatnot, right? Regulations is uh, is always like a little bit slower than technology advancement. Mm -hmm. um, and and here, I think that that's the biggest uh, thing, A, to get the regulation right for those markets. Um, if you think about the US, for instance, there's a, um, a great uh, market in California happening where the influx of uh, renewables has decreased significantly because of that market being there. Um, if you look at Europe, there are some countries um, in the Nordics that are that are pretty in advanced in that. Um, there And then it's a spotty picture. There are some really advanced countries, some not so advanced, and um, the... I think for technology to play out its full force, homogenization or standardization of such market approaches really helps. Mm -hmm. Because then you don't build something for one market and the next one for this market and the next one for this market, but you can really invest into one technology um, that makes it happen for many markets. And here, regulation and especially the EU can help um, to have a common framework, to have faster regulations and um, also help itself to get out of this uh, subsidy game, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and as you mentioned, it's not it, – the speed is essential. And if the, the speed of the technology or the capabilities is is throttled, let's call it, like an upload limit um, for – by this legislation, then our chances of being successful are, are severely diminished. And, yeah. and this is something we have to avoid somehow. Yeah, I would agree. So uh, I just look at the time. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, maybe I'll pass to you for for a quick summary. Uh, you know, we, we talked about grid edge and what it is. We talked about why it's so important for this, this energy transition and then some of the key features or, or journeys we need to take as an industry and, and as a company. If you were talking to a uh, an institution, a, a university, a, a shopping mall, uh, or a government, a local government, and you and you have one sentence or one statement to say to them to say, listen, you know, th this is this is something you need to focus on. What, what would you say to them, or what do you think is important for them to consider? I would just say it's worthwhile now, and mm -hmm. it's not green or um, financially viable today it's both yep. because the tipping point has been reached and it's it, it's something that is worthwhile and you should be doing now mm -hmm. the thing is let's let us help you to make it easy mm -hmm. perfect i like it because now that tipping point is so important right it, it's no longer you're no longer donating money to be green 
it can it can be green and viable at the same time and that's a huge difference from a position that perhaps we were in 10 years 20 years ago exactly amazing sabina thank you so much for your time thank you it was a pleasure uh discussing likewise i hope it's not the last discussion we have because i feel like we've scratched the surface but there's plenty more uh, in in this topic to, to talk about uh, thank you also to all those out there listening. Please feel free to like, share or comment on this episode. Ensure that you subscribe where you're listening or watching us and keep an eye out because there will certainly be more episodes, but there will definitely be more episodes around the grid edge uh, and how distributed energy resources can, you know, can be the vehicle for us to achieve these sustainability goals. So thank you and we'll see you again soon.